Hello, I'm Karen Pascal. I'm the executive director of the Henry Nouwen Society. Welcome to a new episode of Henry Nouwen, Now and Then. Our goal at the Henry Nouwen Society is to extend the rich spiritual legacy of Henry Nouwen to audiences around the world. Each week, we endeavor to bring you a new interview with someone who, like Henry Nouwen, is thoughtfully and freshly exploring the concerns and issues of Christian spirituality today. We invite you to share the daily meditations and these podcasts with your friends and family. Our core purpose is to share Henry Nouwen's spiritual vision so that people can be transformed by experiencing themselves as God's beloved. Now let me introduce you to my guest today. I am delighted to have the opportunity to speak with Father Ron Rollheiser. Ron is the author of 17 books. The latest is Ron Rollheiser Essential Spiritual Writings, and it's part of the Orbis Books Modern Spiritual Master series. I've always considered Ron the leading scholar and interpreter of Henry Nouwen. This book is a treasury of Ron's best writing, addressing themes like what is spirituality, sexuality and sacred fire, faith, doubt, and dark nights within the soul, prayer and the perennial invitation to go deeper, and on and on. Father Ron and his editor, Alicia von Stamowitz, have drawn not just from his published books, but also from the weekly publication In Exile, a weekly column that appears in over 80 papers around the world. Ron, welcome to Henry Now and Now and Then. This book really delivers on your essential spiritual writings. What I enjoyed most is your tone. There's honesty, wit, and kindness woven throughout. You have a real understanding of human nature, but also of God's nature. Tell me, how did this book come about? Did Alicia push you to do it, or did Robert Ellsberg? How did the book come about? Well, you know, um, it, Robert Ellsberg, who is the editor and the publisher at, that, that, uh, uh, at Orbis, uh, he approached me to do the book, and of course I was highly, highly flattered. Um, you know, like that, that, that's a series of some 40 or 50 books. And it's ma- major theologians come back to Terre de Chardin's. It's a little bit in spirituality, like the Hall of Fame. <laughs> <laughs> but then he, he said, who might be an editor? Because, you know, you don't do the book yourself. Somebody sets the book up. And I'd worked with Alicia on a number of projects, you know, when she was with, with uh, different presses, liturgical press, Franciscan press. And I knew she'd be really good and that she knows my writings through and through. So I asked her, and so she uh, she met with me a couple of times to look at different writings, but basically Alicia set the book together. But it, it was Orbis Press, their initiative, so it's part of a series, and like I said, Karen, I was highly flattered. That's, uh, that's, I don't uh, blame you. You're a modern spiritual master. That's a great <laughs> title, right? <laughs> Spirituality Hall of Fame, you know? <laughs> I could see you putting that on a lapel, you know? <laughs> I'm a modern spiritual master, but I truly believe you are, Ron. I get so much out of your writing. And when I dipped into this book, I have to say, I got lots out of it. I really have enjoyed it. You start by telling a little bit of your own story. And it was interesting to me, you told about an event right at the beginning about actually a suicide that had a profound impact on you. Yeah. Um, it seemed to be like something that stopped you in your tracks. Tell me about that. Yeah, you know, it happened in, in when I was 14 years old, summer of 14, you know, who is it? Steinbeck wrote the summer of my discontent. Um, I was 14 years old. I was in high school. And my biggest ambition was to try to make the baseball team. That was all I was on my mind. And, um, and I came to breakfast one morning and uh, my neighbor that dropped into the yard, we were in a farm, talked to my dad. My dad came in, it was pretty somber. And he says, uh, our neighbor said, he had hung himself at the bar the night before. And, and this guy was a man of about 25 years old, you know, perfect body, handsome, a really nice guy. And, you know, at that age, I had nothing with which to process that, this guy killing himself. And in my whole life, Karen, nothing has ever scarred me or touched me as deeply. I just went through a, a six months of just, um, you know, trying to process this. I was very unhappy. Um, and then in, in June, another young person from our community got killed in an in in industrial accident. And then in September, one of my best friends died in a horseback riding accident. And so it was just that summer, it, um, um, you know, I've, through the deaths of my parents and siblings and so on, I've never been uh, touched that much. It's also one of the reasons why I still write a lot about suicide. Um, you know, um, it just changed my life. 
you know, there's another way of putting it, you know, and that's, that's, that's um, 60 years ago, almost. And it's still, you know, uh, I can pull the memory up as fresh as if it happened yesterday. It's interesting to me that it's a time when we feel invincible, you know, death feels so far away. And it actually came right into your face, into your life, into and also your story. Suicide. Like, you know, it's one thing if a, you know, somebody dies, it's against their will. It's the one thing, like this handsome young man who's, you know, his body I envied. He was an athlete. And I thought, um, you know, for him just to kill himself, it's just, uh, um, and then of course, you know, religiously at that time, we had, if, if somebody commits suicide, will they go to hell and all kinds of stuff. You're processing all this stuff and so on. But I think it was the first time it was just, that death was real before that some old people died. And, you know, when you're 14 with if somebody 60 years old, they're old. You know? <laughs> <laughs> this, this just made it real. And it, um, but it was a faith experience. Uh, you know, I think my vocation and a lot of things rose out of that where you say, what's important in life? What do I believe in? And so on. It's interesting to me. Um, I love kind of hearing your roots, your Saskatchewan roots and, and in it, um, and, and obviously, it's a, a route that you turn back to, return to on a yearly basis. Um, but as I read through these pages of um, spiritual insights, I am rather struck by, does it ever surprise you that you became a priest? I mean, of all things, you have such a terrifically, for lack of a better word, robust, wildly interesting um, idea about life. And about God, and it, it, it engages me so much in your books. But I, I wonder, did you ever think, how did I get here? Yes and no. Uh, you know, <laughs> the irony is, Karen, uh, that's been clear. You know, and and it's not something I wanted. I became priesthood because of a call. You know, when I was in high school, the last thing I wanted to be was was a Roman Catholic priest. You know, that the whole thing about the you know, the whole black and the Catholic and uh, being set apart from others and celibacy and everything else. I thought, this isn't for me. It was a call. Um, and, um, you know, I made that decision at 17 after I finished high school. I'm going to go to the seminary. Um, it's the most difficult decision I ever made in my life. And it's the clearest one I ever made. People say, how can you do that at 17? And I look back, that's the clearest, purest decision I ever made in my life. You know, um, and, and part of it was still, you know, maybe a remnant from the 14-year-old uh, processing suicide and death. But I just realized that this is what I'm called to. And I kind of made this deal with God. I'm going to try this. But as soon as it doesn't work, I'm going to leave. But it always worked. And, you know, you know as a, a, life, a priest's life is not easy. A celibate life isn't easy, you know. Um, and something I thought, like, in the world. But... Um, it's always worked for me and, and, and I've always been happy and it's always been generative. So I thought like, um, it ain't broke, don't fix it. <laughs> you know, I've always been at a place where, you know, I, 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 I felt I was able to generate life. It's generated life in me. Um, it's kept me growing, you know, that, um, um, you know, I have my own faults and weaknesses, but I'd, I'd be a lot worse if I wasn't a priest, you know. And, and I don't mean this cynically, I probably saved some poor woman from having a, a, a bad husband. <laughs> <laughs> in this book, this book that we're talk, going to talk about is Essential Spiritual Writings. Well, what's the difference between spirituality and theology? It's a good question. I always tell that to my students. What's the difference between theology and spirituality? Uh, I'm going to use a simple rule, a simple thing here. Um, well, first of all, most theology, Karen, isn't theology. It's writings about theology. You know, the word theology, let's start with the word theology means, you know, it comes from two Greek words, theos and logos. Theos is God, logos is words. It's words about God. So, you know, our creeds and stuff are words about God, but a lot of theology is words about those words. <laughs> you know, um, but spirituality is theology being lived out. So I'm going to give you a simple analogy, which I give my students, and that is, you know, for instance, you take a, a game, hockey, okay, since you're doing with Canadians here. Hockey is a game, and you have the rule book. You got to play within those parameters and rules. Uh, that's theology, but spirituality is the game. <laughs> See, the, <laughs> theology tells you, you know, the, the, the limits of creed and what it means and so on, but you're living it out. That's spirituality. 
so that, uh, um, it, yeah. So theology, it's the rules. It's It sets you, this is the field you need to play on and here are the rules by which you play. But spirituality is the game, it's living it out. So maybe spirituality is how you live out your theology. Because for instance, as you know, as Christians, we have the same basic theology. We have very different lives sometimes. You know, yeah. even the churches, how they, you know, a Lutheran and a Roman Catholic or an evangelical live out the gospel can be, you know, there's fundamentally, there's some parts of the same, but, but there's different ways. There's, so for instance, Roman Catholicism is a spirituality. Um, evangelicalism is a spirituality. It's a different way of living out the game, you know. Right. A healthy soul keeps us both energized and glued together, which I find is a great expression. Um, and everyone has to have a spirituality. You, you're, you're quite convincing about that. I find that interesting, too. Tell me how Henry Nouwen influenced you, because it seems to me, we, maybe I'm wrong, but I, I don't know that so many were talking about spirituality, but you have become such a wonderful voice for this. And probably prior to you, it was Henry. Tell me a little bit about that relationship of you to Henry Nouwen. Yeah, you know, actually, to, uh, I'll get to his influence, but I only actually only met Henry Nouwen once in summer of 88. Um, and actually, it, he wasn't supposed to be on the, on the card. The, the, there was a national health convention in Winnipeg, huge, 800 people or something. And I was one of the keynote speakers. And Mary Malone was the other keynote speaker, but her husband died. And so they were desperately looking for a speaker. And Henry happened to be in Winnipeg. So they brought him, and of course he wowed the crowd. Um, <laughs> and you know, and I was actually upset with the crowd because you know the whole world was trying to get him to speak. They had him; they didn't know who he was. So during the coffee breaks, people said he's not bad. You know, for a substitute, he's pretty good. <laughs> and I thought, Everybody's trying to get him. You get him by accident. You don't know what he has. You know. So I met him there, and we wrote a couple of times, and so on. That was my only personal experience. But the experience of his writings, my life is huge, huge. And, um, you know, and again, I'm glad you talked about the distinction between theology and spirituality. See, the theologians have most influenced me was St. Augustine, and then Thomas Aquinas, and then Karl Rahner. Those are all theoretical people, you know, but Henry, really, Henry is, is in that tradition. You know, if, if you take Karl Rahner and St. Augustine and, and, and um, um, you know, Thomas Aquinas, and you, 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 you boil them down and distill them and put them on the ground. That was Henry, you know. See, so 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 Henry gave that legs. <clears throat> so I'm a theologian. I'm a spiritual writer. When I write theology, I get used to those people. But see, Henry now and gave this legs. But also, and I'm going to try to explain this. It's very important. He gave it a genre, you know. And um, let me explain what I mean by that. Um, I'll use a simple example. I have a, a friend. Um, Stephen Bell, who's a, I think you've met Stephen, I think it was at the Nowen Convention, and he, he's a music writer. And he tells his story, he said he was the, the, the son of a Baptist minister, and he said, I wasn't allowed to listen to rock music, or, and he says, um, and I was a musician, he said, so I just didn't know, I did, I, I know I can't write church music, and I, gospel rock I don't like, and he said, he said, and one day I heard John Michael tell and I thought, that's it. I can, I can do like that. And he's become a, a very good writer. See, there's so many of us, you know, if you look at spiritual writings before Henry now in different traditions. So you have the classical spiritual writings, the imitation of Christ, you know, and then Francis de Sales and this, and then you have more recently people like Fulton Sheen, or you have in the evangelical tradition, Billy Graham, and you have all these spiritual writers, you know, I want to try to put the I'm not Billy Graham. I'm not Fulton Sheen. I'm not the imitation of Christ. Like, you know, when Nowen came along, he said, that's it. Like Nowen essentially invented a language and a genre, you know. See, this is the way you write spirituality. And today, <laughs> almost everybody at the popular that, that, that's worth reading is writing in that genre, you know. So lo notice we're not writing like the imitation of Christ. We're not writing like uh, Francis of Sales to devout life. We're not writing like Billy Graham, you know, um, you know, or, or Evangel, you know, the, the, the charismatic type writing and so on. Everybody's writing like Henry Nowen, you know, and, um, and Nowen, you know, I, I, I've given talks in this. He has a formula. 
I'm not sure if he ever explicitly wrote it down, but he gave it in pieces. And I've read the, you know, on, on how you write spiritually, you know, and, and it's, all, it's always paradoxical. So for instance, Henry tried to be simple without being simplistic. So he would rewrite his books over to try to make them simple, but not simplistic, you know, which is exactly what Jesus was. Jesus has stories simply for kids, but they're, you write books on them, you know. See, and then Henry wanted, Henry never hid the fact that he was a Roman Catholic priest, you know, but he wasn't writing denominationally. He wrote out of that, but his, his thing almost has a universal scope. And then, you know, a, 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 um, um, an art he mastered that very few people get it. Henry was, and that's made Henry's run. Henry could write deep personal things that bear the soul without being exhibitionistic. You know, most people can't do that. Either, you know, they self-protect too much and it's too safe or they become exhibitionistic. And people say, more than I need to know. <laughs> you know remember, when he Henry, like he could bear his soul, you know. Remember, just I give some quotes where Henry says, you know, I want to be a great saint, but I want to experience all the sensations that sinners experience. He said, I want to have a, a deep life of prayer, but I don't want to miss anything on television, you know. See, only Henry could formulate stuff like this, you know. See, so that you could be deeply personal, but not exhibitionistic. You know, you never have to turn your eyes, you know, and, and say, I don't want to see this. I don't need to know this, you know, and, and all the ways. So, so he developed a genre. He developed a language. Um, and one of the things he taught me, too, is he taught me the difference between Jesus and Christ. You know, you know that I used to, before I got deeply influenced by Henry, I would always write the synonyms like Jesus Christ. That's like his second name, you know, Jack Parker, Susan Smith, <laughs> Jesus Christ. You know. And Henry, no, no, you know. Jesus is a person who you have intimacy with. Christ is a mystery that you're part of, you know? And so now I'm really careful. You're talking about Jesus, or you're talking about Christ, or you're talking about Jesus Christ, the two together, and so on. But all the way down, I, you know, I make about 15 distinctions like that. But um, so, so Henry, and, and, and first of all, the other thing where Henry influenced me is he influenced all of us that was so powerful. Uh, he could share his weakness, you know, and share his weakness in such a way that it, it, it first of all, wasn't exhibitionistic, but it al actually helped you to move forward, you know? Um, and partly that's the essence of spiritual writing, you know? And um, uh, so Karen, his influence on my, on my, on my spirituality, and it, it, it's just huge. Um, in fact, I gave a talk the other day to, uh, to um, at a workshop and, um, and you know, I said, I'm going to use some Henry now on pedagogy right now, you know, and that, that was his thing about movements, you know, from loneliness to solitude, from hostility to hospitality. You know, a lot of people are using that. They use it pedagogically and so on. So that was Henry. Um, as you know, he was a tortured genius, but he was a genius. Um, to me, Henry's still a saint, you know, uh, a tortured saint, but a real saint. I love that. I love that. And I love your knowing of him and understanding. And it's funny because as I read this, this book, this essential spiritual writings, I find that kind of um, self-deprecating honesty in you. You're very real about who you are. There's no, you, you, you don't build a high pedestal. You kind of undo yourself in the midst of this. And I find that very refreshing and actually makes it so easy to take from somebody who, who comes down and lives on my level and tells me, I'm just like this, and this is what you're going to get. In the book, you call eros the basis of spiritual life. Can you explain what you mean by that? How is eros the basis of spiritual life? Okay, good question, Karen. For, first of all, for most people in our Western world now, when we say eros or erotic, they think sex. You know, no, no. Sexuality it's an important, but it, it's, it's only one part of that. Eros is your life principle. You know, when a baby is born, as Freud says, it's just as pure. It reaches out. It, it pulls everything to itself and tries to eat up the world. You know, it's your life principle. You know, it, it's, it's all your energy. It's your eros, you know. Now, notice that comes from, that's your spirit. That comes from your spirit, you know, like, like your soul isn't some invisible piece of tissue paper that's floating around inside your body. Your soul is your principle of energy. It is your spirit, okay? So quite simply what it says, what you do with your spirit is your spirituality. 
So, you know, uh, the famous example, if I wrote it today, I'd use different people maybe, but remember I used that famous example, like three kinds of spirituality. So you look at Mother Teresa. So everybody, Mother Teresa was a deeply spiritual woman, you know, but mother, very few people think of Mother Teresa as an erotic woman, this kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> but Mother Teresa is very erotic that she had a powerful energy inside of her. I mean, she steamrolled her. Nobody was fooled by this little woman, you know. She just, she was this power force in history, but she had it all channeled, just God and the poor, God and the poor, God and the poor. And that was her spirituality. Then on the other side, I put Janis Joplin. Today, you could use Michael Jackson, Amy Winehouse, Whitney Houston, a lot of uh, actors and so on who have died, who, you know, you never think of them as spiritual. They were powerful spiritual figures, you know, not like Mother Teresa, like, for instance, uh, uh, Janis Joplin, she could go in an arena with 50,000 people and simply create energy, you know, but she struggled to channel it. Her energy went everywhere and eventually it killed her, you know, that, uh, see, so, but that was her spirituality. Mother Teresa is this kind of spirituality, Janis Joplin is that kind of spirituality. Then in between, she was, it's a wonderful example. Now, I don't know if today's generation will still get her, but is, is Princess Diana, you know, you know, it's interesting, Princess Diana died 1997, you know, at that point, at, at that time, her death and funeral stopped the world, her funeral more than any other funeral in history of kings and popes and so on, it was the most watched event ever. And people say, why she didn't do anything, you know, um, she was the people's princess. And I know I, I, I watched her funeral with fascination. I thought, why am I intrigued with this woman? Well, in some sense, she was exactly half Mother Teresa and half Janis Joplin, you know, see, so she had a powerful <laughs> eros, but, you know, so she'd go and work with Mother Teresa and, and she learned how to say the rosary. In fact, she's buried with a rosary from Mother Teresa in her hand, and, um, you know, and she'd uh, work with the poor. And the next week she'd go on a vacation with a playboy on the French Riviera. You know, that's kind of, <laughs> you know, so, and, and eventually that also in some sense led to her death, you know, but see, but we always say, well, Mother Teresa was spiritual. Janis Joplin wasn't. Uh, uh, and uh, Princess Diana was half spiritual. No, that's what's their spirituality. That's what everybody has one. How, what you do with your energy inside is your spiritual and how you channel it. Now, I'll give you a word. You know, we, we use the word in Christianity, discipleship. We're disciples of Christ. But notice where that word comes, Karen. It comes from the word discipline. See, you know, you put yourself under a discipline. Christianity is a discipline. Buddhism is a discipline, you know. And see, so that, that's the way you discipline your eros, you know. So you're a Christian, I'm a Christian. You know, we, 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 your eros itself is wild. It goes in every direction. Your eros wants to drink in the whole world, you know. And now you discipline it, you channel it. And um, by discipleship, I think very few people realize that discipleship comes from the word uh, discipline. And, you know, in fact, the, the, it's even clearer in, in Hinduism and, and, and Buddhism. You know what they call their spiritualities? They call it a yoga. <laughs> see, see we, we use yoga for a physical. A, that's a yoga. You, you, you practice a yoga, but for them, the yoga means not just the body. It's, it's, these are the disciplines you do, you know. Um, so... We use the word discipline, discipleship. They use the word yoga. There's a lovely quote in your book that says, we are each a bundle of untamed eros, a wild desire, longing, restlessness, loneliness, dissatisfaction, sexuality, and insatiability. This is not a sign that something's wrong. It means something is right. Right. It's your aliveness, isn't it? Yeah. Can I tell you a story on that? You know, since we we're talking about my youth, you know, I went to novitiate when I was 17 and I was 18 when I was there. And so, yeah, at the picture of this, there were, were, there were 18 of us and three faculty members. So the 18 of us, the average age is probably 18 or 19. So there were like 18 guys about 19 years old and we're sequestered. In those days, they sequestered. So we were across the, a lake from a town and a freeway. But for that year, we only saw each other. Young guys, because of course we're full of testosterone and every kind of thing and so on. And then we're just talking about Jesus and the bread of life and so on. And um, and one day, 
we had a visit from an elderly priest, great old guy. And he gets us into a, into a conference room and he says, uh, he says, you guys a little restless? Yes, he said, great. He said, that's good. He said, Jesus, you must be jumping out of your skin. He says, God, you must be going nuts over here. He says, 18 year old guys watching life across the lake. He said, that's good. It means you're healthy. It's good. You know, and you know, I realized that was the first time somebody gave me sacred permission to feel what I'm feeling. You know, he said, you're going nuts. He said, good, good. He said, otherwise you'd have to need some hormone shots, you know, but see, he gave us sacred permission to feel what we're feeling. I hope that line that you just read helps give people a little sacred permission to, to, you know, because oftentimes in, in the name of spiritual, we deny this like, no, I don't feel like that. But it's like the person who, who's white knuckled says, I'm not angry. No, no, you're angry. <laughs> we are restless critters. You know, I think that describes so well what people are going to find in this book. And it's one of the reasons I'm going to recommend it. You give permission for people to feel what they're feeling. You know, in a sense, we're, we're in that camp looking across the lake going, I, I don't want to live in denial of what I'm feeling. That's exactly what Henry did, too. You know what Henry did? Henry is one of the people who gave me permission to feel what I'm feeling. You know, that, that's one of his great strengths. And maybe where I imitate him most or so on or, or draw from is just permission to feel your complexity. Because, you know, Henry was one complex critter. They could write two books of abnormal psychology on him, you know, but, but that's what made him deep, you know. And he gave you permission to feel your complexity, your pathologies and say, you know, like, that's what it means to be a human being. It's interesting the number of times we, we just hear from our people that read the daily meditations, how much it's like, he's just like me. And that makes it so genuinely valuable because you see in it, you see in it godliness, saintliness, and reality. And we are this wonderful mix of all of those things. And it is very meaningful. I was going to tell you that one of the parts of the book I enjoyed so much was as you very honestly speak about loneliness, uh, about the what that's all about. It, it really struck me. And you had five types of loneliness, but I would say the honesty of loneliness as the human condition is, is has to be confessed first. Explain how you mean confessed. As I read it was, I felt like you basically, you'd go back and say, yeah, you are lonely. We've, we've all been in a, in our own way abandoned in birth. We're kind of longing to go back into a belonging. There's, I think what I found in your book was the depth to which you understand how we long to belong. You know, that's that's something that I loved there. Can I give you something colorful in that? You know, it won't scandalize your audience, but I used to tell students, you know, like um, there's this great line in scripture in the book of Koheleth, Ecclesiastes, where he says, God has made everything beautiful in its own time, but God has put timelessness into the human heart. So the human heart is out of sync with the seasons, you know? And I would say, you know what that means? I said, it means this is it. Cattle contentedly munch grass in pastures and human beings discontentedly smoke grass in bars. That's the <laughs> no, see cattle don't get lonely. I mean, they get a little bit, but anyway, they don't, they don't get, they don't have this deep restlessness, human beings. It's part of our nature. And again, it's the part that's for God. Like, you know, the deepest thing that's influenced all of my theology and thinking St. Augustine, you've made us for yourself, Lord, and our hearts are restless and lonely until they rest in you. That captures it all, really, you know? It does. It does. Um, you mentioned that you think that in a way, loneliness, and that, that kind of goes with what you just said, is the very thing, the per there's a purpose in loneliness that pulls us toward people, pulls us towards experience, pulls us with longing towards connecting. You know, because um, we haven't talked about yet, you know the word sexuality, sex, you know, you know, it, you know, I don't know if that's in the book because <laughs> we've been made to cut, but but you know the the word sex in English comes from two from the Latin verb sicari, and sicari means literally to cut off. So if you take a chainsaw, you saw a branch off, you've just sexed that branch. See, now it's lying on the ground, it's disconnected from the whole. See, so our sexuality, so it it's it wants to drive us back to the whole, to community, to family, to you know, celebration and so on. See, so that um, uh, so that we're lonely, and and we're we're also lonely in sex, not just in our bodies, 
but in every part of us, in our spirit, in our souls, you know, like uh, where where we're cut off and we want to be part of something whole. We want, we, we need to be part of a union of a community of communion. It's interesting because you admit in the book that Christianity still struggles to fully celebrate sexual passion. I find you dare to go there and you go there so totally to talk about it. And I, I think it's one of the, the best parts about this book. You talk about it, failure to celebrate healthy sexuality. Well, Karen, let me give you a little background. It's interesting, you know, as, as a celibate, um, early on, I got uh, wrote a few articles and I got a lot of pushback and I, and I got <laughs> scared. And so, for instance, when I wrote The Holy Longing, I didn't write a chapter on sexuality. I didn't. I just thought, like, they don't need to hear something from a celibate. They're going to say, what does he know? And so on. And then I submitted that my first publisher was Hotter and Stoughton in England before it went to Doubleday. And a very sharp editor there, Kieran Armitage, she phoned me. She says, Father, you, you have to write a chapter on sexuality. She said, you can't write a book on spirituality. And I, so I did it, you know. And actually, it's one of the best reviewed chapters in the book, you know. Um, but I, I'm convinced, for instance, I'm a Roman Catholic, and I'm, I'm, a, uh, and I'm a proud Christian and so on. But I'll be the first person to say, like, not just Roman Catholicism. We've never had anywhere in the church or the churches a healthy, robust, real spirituality and, and sexual ethos. We haven't, you know. So, for instance, in Roman Catholicism, and then I say this sympathetically, I am one. You know, for instance, who gets canonized in the church? Celibates. <laughs> I'm going to get, I can get canonized. You can't because you're married. You know, so, so what is that saying? And, and John Paul actually took it one further. He canonized the couple because they were heroic. They weren't having sex. And so he's saying, what is that saying? Or, or um, and I've explored that in my writing. Sometimes if I write an article where in any way I attribute sexuality to Jesus, to Mary, or to some holy person, I get canceled in a newspaper. You, you can't do that. You know, it's just like, uh, you know, a few years ago, I wrote an article, I quoted Robert Moore, and I still like this line. Robert Moore says, you know what, God is ineffable. Because we're talking about God's gender. You can't say God is a he, and you can't say God is a she, and God isn't trans, and God isn't bisexual. Well, because we can't conceive of God, but God is male and female. And so Robert Moore says, um, you know how we should think of God? And I think he was quoting Iliadi, And uh, he said, think of perfect masculinity and perfect femininity, making perfect love all the time. And that is why God is so fertile. And, you know, well, I wrote that in an article, an editor of a newspaper sent me an email. He says, you got to withdraw that. That's blasphemous. I said, well, if you find one professional theologian or one bishop who will publicly dispute that, you know, and I'll, I'll withdraw it. So a week later, he sent me a little email. He says, be that as it may, we're going to move on with younger writers. <laughs> said, from the guy. But, you know, um, you know, you just, you can't touch that. You know, um, but it shows there's still there's still blockage. Now, you know, I'm, I don't want to pick on Roman Catholicism or Christianity. We haven't done it, but neither has anybody else. You now, I look at the world. I don't see a health, healthy sexual ethos. It's not in secular culture. It's not in Chinese or communist culture or Buddhist cultures and so on. It's not in Islamic culture. If someone says, where do you think among everybody, there's the, the healthiest, I would say the Judaism. Jewish culture, you know, you know I, I see that sometimes in Judaism where there, there's a, a much healthier, robust expression of sexuality that's still responsible. See, our culture now is free of sex, but it's completely irresponsible. I mean, it's, that, that's, that's not the way to go. You take all the brakes off and you have hookup sex and all kinds of stuff. That's, the, that, that's going nowhere. That's going to emptiness, you know. Um, see, so Christianity, sometimes we're kind of the other extreme. And as, as I say in, in the book and say often in, in, in columns, you know, we have to be both passionate and chaste. We got to be robustly sexual and robustly chaste. You know? Explain that. Take that. What do you mean by chaste? When you say that, I have certain things that come to mind. What do you mean? Okay, good question. See, Karen, chastity isn't the same thing as celibacy. Don't mix the two up. See, for instance, I can be celibate and not chaste. Somebody can be chaste and not celibate. My parents were two of the most chaste people I ever knew when they had a big family and none of us were conceived immaculately, I'm sure. <laughs> you know, 
it's ch- chastity is a question of like respect of reverence. Um, in fact, the, the, the primary in a, I- image of chastity comes from scripture and it's Moses before the burning bush. When God says, Moses, take off your shoes, the ground you're standing on is holy ground. So it's, uh, I say chastity is a combination of reverence, respect, and patience, you know, in all relationships. There's got to be a healthy reverence. There's got to be a healthy respect. There's got to be a healthy patience. And, uh, um, you know, Annie Dillard has a wonderful image of chastity. I'm not sure it's in that book, where she said one time she was watching a butterfly coming out of its cocoon, and she was fascinated by this, but said it was interminably slow. So after a few hours, she lost patience, took a candle, and she just heated it a little bit, so it happened faster. But then when the butterfly came out, it couldn't fly. Its wings were premature. You know, see, that's an image of chastity. You know, you have to wait for the proper time and so on. Um, see, so that the world today is very sexual and passionate at times, but it doesn't get chastity. And sometimes the churches get chastity and they don't get a robust sexuality. You know, um, see, it's the two together and it's a tension. I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about something that you really unwrap in this book. And it's the incarnation. You are absolutely determined that we get the incarnation because it seems to be essential. It's got to be a, a bit of a messy Christmas, not a polite one, you know, and I, I love that. I, I think it's really important. Tell us a little bit why you think that's so important and what difference it makes to spirituality. Well, I'll start with the name. You know, we, we call ourselves Christian. And I'm not sure we often realize what that means, or let's take the word Christ. <laughs> I said, Henry helped sort this out. You know, see, the word Christ isn't Jesus' second name, you know. Um, you know, Jack Smith, Jesus Christ, you know. Christ is a title. And basically, Christos means the anointed one, or it really means that place in the world where God has flesh. He's Jesus, the enfleshed one, okay. But see, that's also you and I. That's the entire Christian community. You know, like Paul says, we are the body of Christ. Notice he doesn't say we're like a body or replace the body. He says, we are the body of Christ. So that, and Jesus says, everything I can do, you can do. See, so uh, what I say in the book, Jesus didn't go home on the ascension. See, the incarnation wasn't a 33-year experiment. You know, when Jesus came down and did his 33 years and then went home and, and now the Holy Spirit runs it, you know. Um, Christ came and he never left. Jesus left, Christ didn't leave. And, you know, and, and, and in, in the, especially in the holy longing, I, I draw it on length, the implications of that. Uh, let me just give you one example of the implication of that, which is very, very uh, real and very consoling. You know, so often people come and say, you know, my kids don't go to church anymore. I raised them, they're good, they don't go to church, what can I do, can I pray for them? It says, yeah, you, you, you can be Christ for them. Basically put, if you're a practicing Christian, and this isn't wild fantasy, if you say, my heaven includes my kids, it does. You know, see, you, because you're the body of Christ. And as long as they're relating to you, they're relating to the body of Christ. They may not be going to a formal church. That sounds fantastical. It's not. That's Christian doctrine. You know, um, like Jesus said, all the power I have, I'm leaving you, which isn't the power of the keys. You know, when he says, I give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, he wasn't just talking to Peter. He was talking to all of us, you know, see, so that, um, or you can look at a grandchild or a friend and say, my heaven includes this person. And it does, you know, um, see, th- that's fantastical power. And it's not fantastical doctrine. It, that's solid Catholic Christian doctrine in all the churches. As a professor, whenever I do comprehensive exams for graduate students, you know, and they'll, they'll, they'll say, I'll, I'll ask them this question, what's the difference between being a Christian and being a theist? I said, you know, a theist believes in God. A Christian believes in God in heaven and a God on earth. <laughs> we believe in the Trinity. See, our God isn't just in heaven. Our God is here, you know. And, um, and, you know, for instance, I'm a Catholic priest. People come to me for confession, that sacramental confession. You can forgive somebody. They're forgiven. You can say, I forgive you. You know, I can forgive you. Know, uh, see, that Christic power is everywhere, you know. And see, so now, now I think we're, we're too unaware of it. I think we're, so many of us as Christians, we're theists. We believe in God. But we'd be loath to believe in this earthly Christ who's in, 
you know, the famous line from Teresa of Avila, the hands on earth right now, Christ's hands are your hands. The body, it's your body. His mouth is your mouth, you know. That's lovely. That's that, that's what I am enjoying so much about. That's what you give me uh, as I read this book. And I got to tell you, my favorite chapter was the chapter on prayer. I can't tell you that I'm a terrific prayer or anything like that. I learned a lot in that chapter. I It was really, really helpful. And so in a sense, I want to encourage people. This book, when it says essential spiritual writings, has good stuff on so many different levels. You know, one of the things that came out, and I'm just going to ask you maybe to put it in your own words because I quite enjoyed it, was the difference between meditation and contemplation. I, I think I had those two things merged in my mind, but I learned from something you shared. Maybe you'd share it with the rest of us. Okay. Well, first, Karen, I want to I want to qualify that and sing. What I'm going to give you, that comes from the Carmelite tradition and the Desert Fathers and Mothers. Now, but there's a different software. The Jesuits and Ignatian spirituality wouldn't exactly make it the same way. So, because, you know, the contemplation and, and meditation, they're used in different ways. So I always tell people there's two sets of software out there. Apple <laughs> and Microsoft. <laughs> so I'm giving you the Microsoft software. <laughs> the, Jesuits, the Jesuits are Apple. Okay. But this comes from the Desert Fathers and then through the, the great mystics, Karna, the Trees, and John, and so on. But they say meditation is discursive. And it's it's it precisely an attempt to have a conversation with Jesus, to you know, think about gospel passages and to say, what's Jesus saying to me and what am I asking for? And so on. And that's an important form of prayer. Contemplation is the opposite. Contemplation, you don't try to meditate at all. It's today what we call centering prayer. You just go and sit with God. You just go and sit. You make a meditation at the beginning for two minutes and say, God, I'm here to be with you. Then you just sit. And whatever happens, happens. You're not trying to make a conversation with God. You're not trying to think, what is God trying to tell me? That's meditation. You know, um, you just sit there and... Um, and, and, you know, they, it's predicated on this. Imagine a married couple on their honeymoon, the first couple of years, they have to talk a lot. When you're married for 60 years, sometimes you just have to be in the same room with each other. You don't have to say anything, you know. See, <laughs> the deeper you move with God, they say, the deeper you move into contemplation where it's all been said. <laughs> you just go there and you sit. Um, in fact, Thomas Keating, the, the great spiritual writer, um, you know, when he talks about contemplation, he doesn't even call it prayer. He says, just go and sit, you know, um, just have a, you know, imagine mother's in a senior's home. Just go have a, you sit with her. You may be talking about the weather. You may be talking about nothing. You may both fall asleep. You're there, you know, and that's a deeper form of prayer. They say meditation, that's, that's the beginning. When you're younger and in the spiritual life, you do meditation. Later on, it's important. And that's important because, you know, and John of the Cross say, you'd come to it naturally. You know, when you start practicing meditation, a contemplation is when meditation doesn't work anymore. <laughs> when, you sit, when you sit in church and say, well, you could say your regular prayers and they don't mean the same thing anymore, you know. Uh, but I wanted to go a little, throw a wild card in here. People often ask, well, then, for instance, Roman Catholics, what's the rosary? Is that meditation or contemplation? It can work either way. See, if you're meditating on the mysteries and trying to think that it's meditation, if you're using it simply as a mantra to be present, then it's contemplation. So a lot of our ritual prayers, like the rosary, are beautiful because they can work either way. You can use the rosary as a meditation. You can use the rosary as contemplation, where you simply, the, the beads become your mantra, and you're just with God for those 15 or 20 minutes. Now, Ron, you have um, officially retired. You were the head of the Oblate School of Theology for many years, and now... What are you up to now? Are you, I can imagine you're much in demand as a speaker, because I know that I'm always at your doorstep saying, please come, please come. But what about, uh, what are you up to? Are you writing some new books? Are you, what are you into right now? I'm first going to correct you. I didn't retire. I oh, stepped on as president. No, I'm a full-time faculty member here. And oh. in fact, the irony is I'm maybe busier than before. Um, so I'm working with a lot of thesis students teaching. Uh, but the other the question yeah, I'm writing. I'm writing. Um, I have minor writing projects. I got to write a major article, John of the Cross, and so on. But in terms of books, I have two books uh, that I want to do. And one of them is, is, is the third trilogy from Holy Longing, Sacred Fire. This is going to be called Insane for the Light. 
So Holy Longing is a book about how do you get your life together? Sacred Friends, how do you give your life away? And it's going to be how do you give your death away? How do you age? And, um, and then I want to do, and I'm always hesitant to, to say this because it sounds pious and so on. I want to do a major book of chastity because uh, it's, it's so important and it's died in our culture. It's, uh, you know, I was invited to give a talk at Boston College a few years ago and Tom Groom invited me. He says, I want you to talk about chastity, but don't say the word. It'll turn everybody off, you know, <laughs> but he said it's the most desperately needed thing there is, you know. Um, so um, I want to do a book on, on chastity um, and I want to practice. I'm doing a series of lectures here in March and I want to just test out these ideas on people and so on. Um, yeah, that won't be as major a book. That the big major book is the third of the trilogy of how do you age and die. You know, it's interesting because um, one of the things that we saw with Henry's writing, you know, sort of in the years before he died, he was writing a lot about giving his death away, wasn't he? He was. He had somehow seen beyond that veil and understood that there was going to be a blessing in it that would stay with others. You know, it's interesting. He's one of the first people who tipped us off on that. You know, uh, I've also got it from the mystics, John of the Cross and the mystics. Uh, but most of our spirituality stopped. Most of our spirituality stopped with your aging, you know. And in fact, it, it didn't need to go further because people used to die earlier. You know, <laughs> if you have a heart attack and die at 55 or 60, you don't need a spirituality of aging. You know that in 1900, you know, that's 100 years ago, the average age in the United States and Canada was 40, 40, you know? Oh my goodness. <laughs> you know, it's, it's double, you know? So if people are dying young, you don't, you know, but now it was the first person, the contemporary writer put out a book. Remember he called our last greatest gift. How do you give your death away? You know? And um, it's too bad Henry didn't live longer because he was just beginning to explore that, you know, but today we're, we're, we're trying to develop that into, into something major because it's so needed. Like today, uh, a lot of people retire in their early 60s or mid 60s, and they're wonderfully healthy. They're going to live another 30 years. Now, what are these 30 years for? Yeah. And then, you know, you can't golf for 30 years. <laughs> <It's not full-time. laughs> so what are they for? And then how do you prepare to, as now it says, to make, I like the way it says, that your death is your last greatest gift to your family and community. So that when you go away, you're leaving behind a spirit that's clean, a spirit that isn't clinging, a spirit that isn't bitter, and so on. Um, we have a whole program here at school now called Forest Dwelling, in which we, we take 80 people for a two-year program. They come in a couple of times a year for a week, and so on. we do things that on how do you age and how do you give your death away? Beautiful and important question. Really important question. It is always a treat for me to talk with you. And I do hope that as people are listening, I just want to recommend please get this book, This Essential Spiritual Writings by Ron Rollheiser. He is one of our spiritual masters, one of our living spiritual masters, and and, uh, you will be blessed. The book is just a delicious uh, filling up spiritually, um, clarifying spiritually, and very freeing. That's what I love about you, Ron. It's very freeing. It's very... um, it's very real and very free. Thank you so much. Thank you for being that champion for Henry now. Thank you because you get him and then you help us get him. And that means a great deal to me. Thank well, Karen, you. I want to thank the society. Thank you for keeping Henry so much up because he's important. You know, I don't do this work on Henry now and for somebody. It's it's just, he is that important. You know, he's, a, he's a, you know, I look at what he did in my life, but you know, when I, get students to do papers and stuff on him they're being introduced to themselves you know and and um, and they get the genre you know that's lovely thank you so much thanks for your time this has thanks been good hey, thanks karen and thanks for all the good work you and this society do for thank you bye 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 thank you for listening to today's podcast father ron rollheiser has shared with us some wonderful insights into the spiritual life The new book that brings together an extraordinary collection of Ron's writings is called Ron Roll Heiser, Essential Spiritual Writings. It's published by Orbis. For more resources related to today's podcast, click on the links on the podcast page of our website. You can find additional content and book suggestions. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please take time to give us a thumbs up or a good review. We also want to encourage you to pass on this podcast and our daily free Henry Now and Meditations 
to your friends and family. Thanks for listening. Until next time. Thanks so much for watching. Be sure to subscribe, give us a thumbs up, or follow us on social media for more Henry Nouwen content. For books, videos, and other resources, or if you'd like to receive free daily Henry Nouwen e-meditations, you can follow the links below.